participants. So I'd like to introduce our next speaker, who's Dr. Claire Houston from the Open University. Uh, Claire is a senior lecturer in psychology there and has a long-standing interest in using the internet in primary research and collected data online through a huge uh, variety of means. Uh, she's chair of the OU's Human Research Ethics Committee and has been involved in developing the British Psychological Society's Guidance on Ethics and Internet Mediated Research, which has been a, a long-standing and excellent resource for the community. I know that we cited it at KRIO an awful lot and has an awful lot of relevant academic interest on, to this knotty question of how to conduct research well via online means. So I'm delighted that she's here today to share her insights with us. Claire, thank you very much. Thank you very much, James. Right, I'm going to share my presentation here. Let's see if this works. Hopefully it's going to show up on people's screens there. Yes, that's all. Great. Excellent. Right. So yes, I've got, uh, well, I'm going to set my time for 25 minutes and see if I can stick to that. Um, I, I've, obviously, this is a, a massive topic. So my approach here is to um, just cover some of the options uh, uh, available for gathering data online um, and think about um, some of the issues that emerge um, and then talk about ethics issues in particular, because I, that, that ethics issues do raise some particular complications and quite difficult questions um, when thinking about gathering data online. And I, I'm hoping that I'll have time to make a few comments about, um, well, the, the issue of adapting offline research to online research methods. I, as uh, James said, I'm actually the chair of the Open Universities Ethics Committee. And so I have been quite involved in advising researchers at my own institution on, on how to think about possibilities for, um, as an alternative option to just halting research projects that were planned to be conducted uh, using face-to-face -face methods, thinking about ways that these can be reconstructed, um, thinking creatively about how these can be actually carried out online rather than waiting, obviously, um, you know, it, th things with the, with the lockdown restrictions um, did carry on longer than we might have initially thought. So, so I do have quite a bit of experience of, just the different things people have come up with, the solutions and methods, and 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 obviously the kind of issues that they've had to grapple with in, in thinking about methods that are perhaps not very familiar with um, already, um, and and then the ethics considerations that, that emerge in that context. So I do hope I'll be able to make some comments on some of my insights there. Um, so, right, just that's it. Um, so I think it's useful to uh, when thinking about the possibilities available to just make this distinction between obtrusive methods and unobtrusive methods. This isn't new to online research, but I think it becomes quite relevant, uh, more relevant in online data collection contexts. Um, so obtrusive methods, uh, things like surveys, questionnaires, traditional experiments, interviews, focus groups, etc., can be adapted to an online context and many researchers have engaged in, in doing so. Um, so I'm talking about really where participants are uh, contacted and they knowingly take part in the research. So, so that's what I mean by obtrusive methods. Unobtrusive methods on the other hand um, have particular interest when we're talking about online data collection. Um, this uh, I'm taking as a just general rough broad characterization uh, to be methods where participants may not know that their, their data are being used. Um, so this can happen in observation research traditionally and in relation to online research methods um, of course, um, data mining, gathering data from social media sites, um, web pages, blogs, all, there's all sorts of traces that people leave behind on the web, which can and have formed um, data for research. So I think that that distinction is, is very useful for thinking about the different types of things we can do when gathering data online. Um, right. Uh, I know that Big data is, um, well, I, I don't know if there's a clear definition, well, but there are many different, defini different definitions of big data. Um, and it's a bit difficult. A, a lot of my colleagues say, well, what is big data? What does this mean? Um, well, I just got an example here I quite liked. Uh, there's a website called visualcomplexity.com. Um, it has a lot of examples of visual networks for representing data sets. And um, this is, a way that researchers can represent big data sets 
Um, they're, they're so big that it's actually difficult to use traditional um, tables, graphs, means, etc., to represent the, these types of data analyses. So this one here is um, data that comes from Nike Plus um, app uh, and sensor. Uh, Nike Plus were one of the, the first uh, people to develop um, this kind of GPS tracking for uh, gathering data about running data, basically, that athletes can use. And this here is um, the runs, I think, over, yeah, the visualis visualization of a year's worth of runs uploaded to, to the Nike Plus website um, in New York City. So this shows where runners, um, favorite routes were in, in New York City and you can actually play this data back. Um, another example here closer to home is this is London and I think this was using the Runkeeper app. I, people may have used this, I've used it myself um, and this is again a, a, a run tracker um, and people up, upload their, uh, their running data here and this is a, a track of the runs. We can see the River Thames there and um, people uh, obviously like running along the River Thames and, and around different parts in London. So that's the kind of thing that we're talking about with big, big data. If we um, look at a more sort of social science example, um, then uh, here, this is, this is the kind of thing that's a bit more controversial really when talking about big data research. So this is a paper I came across recently, it's a fairly recent paper. And, and this, um, the title of the paper is Predicting Future Mental Illness from Social Media, a Big Data Approach. And this is in Behavior Research Methods Journal. Um, so just to summarize, um, what the researchers found, uh, they were interested in looking at the language people use in Reddit, which is a, a social media website. And they looked at subreddits, which is smaller groups within the Reddit social media um, community. And they found that the language people used, so, so the words they posted on clinical subreddits, that's subreddits talking about mental health issues, could be used to distinguish several types of mental illness. So that is to identify the, the types of mental health issues that, that people had. So just by the language that they use, that's perhaps not terribly surprising, um, I guess, to many people. Uh, what they found interestingly is that when they looked at the non-clinical subreddits, uh, the language people use there could also be used to distinguish these same categories of mental health status, basically. Um, so that shows that the language people use in different contexts, while not necessarily talking about their own diagnoses or, or mental health issues, um, can be used to make predictions about their current state of mental health. And finally, and they, they found this particularly uh, noteworthy in this study, is that the words that they, uh, the language that people use on the non-clinical subreddits predicted posts to clinical subreddits and they take this to um, they conclude from this that this implies that the everyday language that people use can contain signals about the likelihood of future mental health um, issues uh, that they may experience uh, there are many similar types of work done for example predicting propensity for uh, suicide attempts that kind of thing um, so this is an example of big data research and this raises um, as you can imagine many uh, ethics issues um, in relation to this type of work. Um, just to mention the kind of key characteristics of um, online uh, uh, research um, and, and how this is different from face-to-face -face research, clearly um, it involves gathering data in an absence of face-to-face -face co presence with participants. But, you know, we've, we've had methods, postal surveys and, and so on and so forth, that that do this anyway, but with online research methods, this um, feature is coupled with massively greater scope for carrying out quite interactive and complex procedures with participants. And what researchers were initially concerned about in the um, well, early to mid 90s, really, when people started thinking about using these types of methods, was both the reliability and validity of the data that could be gathered, given the lack of research and control of the participants from this remote interaction, and also ethics issues. Um, so monitoring participants' behaviour, such as their, um, their, their, how, how um, distressed or upset they might have become as part of a, a research study, for example. Um, and the other key thing, of course, which links back to what I've just been talking about with the big da data research, is um, the unprecedented, unprecedented scale of online data traces that are available for researchers to potentially harvest and use in, um, in their research projects. 
And the main issues that um, emerge here really are issues of privacy and consent and confidentiality of people's posts. So um, I'm going to skip over this fairly quickly, but I, I really just wanted to say that um, some of the um, initial concerns about sampling bias, reliability issues and validity concerns have now, in my opinion, and I think in many people's opinions, been largely alleviated due to numerous examples of highly successful uh, methods and studies that have used online uh, methods, IMR, um, Internet Mediated Research, as it's also called. Um, so, so this historical concern, I think, has really been largely alleviated now. Um, and I'm just, um, I've, for, for reference purposes here, and I, I believe these slides will be shared um, uh, with with delegates. Um, I've listed a few um, references for people that maybe want an introduction to this area um, or to look in deeper at some specific methods. Um, and it's worth flagging also some uh, resources that are online. The Association of Internet Researchers have some very useful resources, um, uh, including ethics guidelines. Um, they hold an annual uh, conference uh, meeting um, and have various publications on various issues related to gathering data online. Um, WebSM, Web Survey Methodology, is another very useful site. I think it ceased to be updated since 2018. However, it's got a very large database of possible um, survey software options for uh, conducting surveys online and a very large database of um, publications in this area. So these are just flagged up uh, for reference, really. Um, similarly, I've just listed here for future reference, if anybody wants to explore these, um, some software options. That there are many, many uh, software resources now for online service, um, more, more that I, than I can keep up with. <laughs> um, and uh, the AOIR website does list these and I think have a, a few comments on each package just to show the kind of things they might be useful for. Um, so, so that's useful to consult. But um, I, at my institution, the Open University, we use Qualtrics. Uh, we, it's GDPR compliant and uh, UK Data Protection 2018 Act compliant. So that, that's certainly, well, that's a, a paid option. Um, SurveyMonkey, I think, has issues now when it comes to data protection. Uh, but I think this is something that individual organisations will advise researchers on. Uh, Webster and Gorilla are experiment development um, packages. And then the other four that, that I've listed, including Google Analytics, which is a paid service, um, links into more of a big data kind of approach. So Google collects masses of data from people's online behaviors, particularly web searches. And obviously this can be uh, particularly useful for market research, but also for um, social science um, and, and science researchers, social and behavioral researchers. So those are, that's just flagging up some of the options available there. Um, Zoom, Skype and Messenger, we're using Zoom here today, people be familiar with these, um, are particularly um, useful packages for conducting online interviews or focus groups. Again, there are different issues linking to uh, whether these can be considered to be secure and, and um, safe uh, options to use. Um, business Skype um, is, is a good option for academic institutions. Um, but again, that's something that um, basically um, institutions will advise on, on what um, their staff can use researchers that their organization can use in, in that respect. Um, right, I'm going to move on to um, ethics issues now. Um, and I want to just uh, point out firstly that while, while it might seem that we can just take our existing ethics guidelines and apply these to an online context, things are not, not that straightforward. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of unforeseen risks um, and issues that emerge that researchers well, may not be aware of, they're not obvious um, at first blush. So here are some guidelines and Jane's mentioned the BPS guidelines. Uh, we've just updated those. I was involved in the working group doing that and they will be published this year, hopefully pretty soon actually. Um, I've listed some other resources there. I mentioned the Association of Internet Researchers and there's the American Psychological Society, uh, Association. Um, so those are worth consulting. And there's also a journal of internet research um, ethics, um, which tackles um, these, uh, these issues specifically. To outline some of the key um, things to pay attention to, 
Um, I just I want to say a little bit about each of these and some of some some warnings really and um, some some things to look out for um, and some of the safeguards that researchers ought to be aware of that needs um, thinking about. Um, data security and traceability raises um, additional complexities in an online context, um, understandably because data are being collected and stored online. Um, anonymity and confidentiality linked to that that, that issue. Um, become uh, more difficult uh, to manage. Um, the issue of re-identifiability of anonymized data sets is something that may not be immediately obvious to, to researchers. And um, that's something that I, I can give examples in the discussion if, if, if that's helpful. But that is something that that's, um, really needs uh, careful attention. The public-private distinctions online and, and what is in the public domain. You know, I, I, I have colleagues still saying to me, well, I can, if I can access this without a password, surely I can use it in my research without gaining consent. So uh, needless to say that my, my view is that things aren't that straightforward. Uh, most people working in this area um, and thinking about these issues, the, this is not that straightforward. Um, so, so that's quite a complex issue and um, there's quite a lot of debate and controversy over what can and can't be used without gaining consent. Um, and then the, the, the straightforward issue of um, ensuring that our existing ethics uh, principles and procedures um, are applied in a robust and rigorous way online is non-trivial in some contexts as well. So um, to highlight some of the, the, the key issues in those different um, areas, um, data security and traceability. Well, we have the whole issue of um, where data is stored. Um, so I mentioned Qualtrics and SurveyMonkey. Um, we, we advise users, uh, researchers uh, at the Open University to use Qualtrics because they do have um, data protection um, compliance uh, that, that, that uh, meet um, requirements of UK uh, legislation. Um, there, there can be issues if data are stored in um, the US, for example, or other countries outside the UK and or EU. Um, Gaining um, proper support from IT um, staff um, for, uh, about data, about passwords, access protections and encryption uh, is crucial and important to prevent um, third party access that, that's not desired um, and, and that must be uh, blocked and, and possible hacker um, access to data, that kind of thing. Um, and relating to um, more qualitative type approaches really, the issue that, again, may not be immediately obvious, of being able to trace um, published um, data, such as verbatim quotes, back to its original source um, is something that needs consideration. So publishing quotes, um, if uh, from a researcher who may have accessed um, language uh, data from um, social media websites and discussion groups, for example, may think it's quite harmless to anonymize that in terms of um, quotes without a name or username or pseudonym attached, and then publish that, um, for example, in outputs, uh, journal papers or blogs or on web pages. But just typing that into a search engine could easily link that back to the original post in the original discussion group, uh, reveal the identity of um, an individual and all sorts of other in information about them. So, so that's something that needs careful consideration. Um, in relation to uh, this idea of re-identifiability, um, well, it's again, it's non-obvious that if you've completely anonymized your data set and then you publish this, um, that that could be um, then connected, that the data there can be connected with person with individuals. This is possible, however, and I haven't got time to go through examples, but if you have an anonymized data set and then link it up, and compare it and match it with another data set that contains some of those same patterns of data, but then, then goes beyond that and has additional information about personal identities, you can then um, de-anonymize um, and re-identify people, or other people can, let, let's say, the research not necessarily, but researchers have to think about th this possibility of this happening um, by combining data sets that they've um, published or, or disseminated with other data sets. Um, the whole issue of machine learning algorithms and AI approaches is quite a big um, topic, really. So this is a, just really a comment to raise awareness that certain things can be baked into the data. The example I gave earlier about language data leading to inferences, potentially using computer algorithms, inferences about 
people's uh, mental health status, for example, or their demographic characteristics or protected characteristics, whatever. Um, this, this needs to be carefully considered when doing this type of work and the validity of the algorithms used, the extent to which they can generate trustworthy inferences um, and, and conclusions is an important uh, discussion topic in this area at the moment. Um, regarding public-private domain distinctions, this is something, again, that is useful for discussion. I've said a bit about this, um, but certainly um, from an ethics perspective, going beyond copyright ownership is important. And thinking about people's expectations, I think there's a lack of research on people's expectations in different contexts. Um, and so we have this still this problem of blurred boundary between public and private spaces and what do people expect when it comes to their online behavioural traces being used by researchers. So researchers need to think in, in a context-based way about their particular project um, and how they could uh, navigate and tackle these, these difficult questions about when you need to gain consent, um, what you need to do if you can't gain consent and is it okay to use data without gaining consent and, and there's various different um, answers and perspectives on that. Um, I've mentioned uh, applying existing usual consent, informed consent withdrawal degree procedures. Um, sometimes this can be difficult, imagine an online survey uh, where participants uh, perhaps become upset about something, that, that, you know, some of the questions they're answering, and instead of getting to a point where they can be debriefed by the researcher, they just click and close down their, their browser. Um, that kind of thing can happen. How do you know participants have um, properly read the informed consent uh, information? How do you know that you aren't accessing people who are actually below the age of consent, uh, despite them clicking that they're, they're above the age of consent? That's, that's more problematically sensitive research topics. Um, all these kind of issues require consideration, and I would basically um, just direct people to the British Psychological Society uh, guidelines on that. I think they're obviously specific to, were developed um, to address issues in psychological research, but they're broad enough to apply, I think, to many other um, types of research. Um, so um, for the purposes of, of, of the, um, the, the sharing of, of the, uh, these slides, I've just summarise some advice um, about what to think about when thinking about ethics issues um, and basically summarise all, all the points that I've just raised. Um, in the last few minutes then, I would like to um, just say a bit about research in the pandemic. Um, so I, I, at my institution, the Open University, um, around a year ago or so ago, last March, um, we halted any face-to-face -face research and basically told researchers that that, that wasn't um, an option. So any projects um, ongoing that had uh, were using face-to-face -face methods had to be halted, um, and any new projects could not be um, approved by the ethics committee that proposed face-to-face -face methods. Um, this led to um, researchers having to think quite creatively about how to redesign their research um, to to be able to continue. Um, and also design new projects within the constraints that data could not be collected in the, the usual face-to-face -face ways that they were used to using. So I, I've got a few examples, um, which I think pick up on some of the ethics complexities and difficulties um, that, that they're thinking about. Um, so uh, the, these actually are examples where researchers have set out to actually do some valuable research around the whole COVID and, and pandemic and lockdown situation, uh, but where they would have often used face-to-face -face uh, methods rather than remote methods. Um, but within these constraints, uh, so for one example here is about collecting lockdown stories. So trying to find out people's experiences of, of um, lockdown, particularly from marginalized and vulnerable groups. And these are kind of um, based on real examples. So I've had to carefully anonymize them <laughs> uh, for confidentiality reasons. So I'm, I'm not giving up too much detail. But this, this approach really was to ask for um, picture stories and text from the, the, these participants to be sent by social media apps and email, etc. And also sharing existing uh, posts that, that they posted previously. Um, and this raises issues mainly to do with um, looking after data, security and confidentiality issues. Um, and also how to gain consent. And these particular groups didn't have access to perhaps um, some of the ma main technologies that others might have. So it was mainly kind of WhatsApp and, and phone type apps that were 
um, options here. Uh, so that raised some issues. Um, this example is actually quite interesting. Um, and, and again, this is um, trying to design uh, research with children on their experiences of um, COVID and, and lockdown. And I think often projects in my experience with children would involve face-to-face -face interactions. Uh, that, that seems to be the most effective way to gather data from children. In this case, uh, the, re the researchers thought creatively about what they could do, um, not being able to do that. And they um, basically um, gathered um, public data from pavements and in parks, and the kind of drawings that people did, and also um, some of the stories and texts and images that were being posted up in people's windows in, in their living rooms and bedrooms and so on and so forth. So this raises issues of privacy. And although it's not strictly speaking online research, it, it kind of grew out of a, a need to um, not do face-to-face -face research and raises some of the same issues um, in an offline context. Um, so in the end, um, after some discussions, um, an opt-out approach was considered reasonable here where um, uh, people were posted a leaflet, the researchers posted a leaflet through people's doors and asking them to opt out if they weren't happy about photographs of their, their pictures that were posted in, in their windows publicly being used. Um, so, so that's, you know, th these are just examples of the kind of things that you have to think about um, when trying to design research that's, um, yeah, that, that has to respond in, in, a, in a pandemic context. Um, the third example, many uh, people turned to using Twitter, Instagram and Facebook to try and gather data uh, in ways that they may not have necessarily thought about it if it hadn't been um, lockdown restrictions in place. Um, and here we have the issues that I've mentioned already um, about when is it okay to use these data? These are complex issues and I can't uh, solve that or make any sort of hard and fast rule-based suggestions for this, um, but many things need to be um, considered. And again, the BPS guidelines and, and the AOIR guidelines and other guidelines on ethics in online research methods do cover these, uh, these various considerations. Um, oh yes, finally this example. Well, um, a lot of researchers I'm finding now are taking advantage of online panels um, this is a great way to access participants in, in some ways. Um, if you have a bit of funding, uh, you can use a Mechanical Turk, for example. There are some, um, maybe some sort of moral issues related to that and, and payments um, levels. Uh, but there's many online panels. Prolific's another one. And more and more researchers are using these. Um, some of them are suspect. And um, I, I came across one uh, suggestion to use one of was, I think it was called polefish. So there are a lot of kind of corporate examples of where, where the main uh, the, the, the main motivation behind offering these services are you know profit making uh, as, as, a, as a business model uh, rather than to provide a service for say academics conducting research. And in one particular case, um, I came across a, um, an example of a research design where consent could not be gained because it wasn't that, that flexibility wasn't offered. Um, and basically, and fully anonymized data would just be sent to the researcher uh, with no uh, links between the researcher and individuals. Um, and this raised some issues because sensitive questions were being asked about um, health status and, and whether you tested positive for COVID or that kind of thing. Um, and there was no um, option to debrief either, but participation was paid. That's just another example, which uh, I think um, raises some of the issues related to use, using online panels and the necessity to carefully select which panels um, are being used um, and, and think about these issues really carefully. So um, I think lessons to be learned then um, from the pandemic um, context and, and conducting research in a pandemic. Um, I, in my experience, I found that many researchers found that being forced to look at these alternative methods that didn't involve face-to-face -face, um, interactions led to revelations um, that they perhaps weren't aware of about some of the opportunities and advantages of adapting traditional methods to think about how they could be done online. Um, and so many successful uh, projects I've seen adapted what would have been face-to-face -face, um, interviews and focus groups to do these via, um, well, Skype, uh, business Skype in our case, or Microsoft Teams. Zoom, um, I, th I think is used and fairly um, safe in, in many ways. Um, so the advantages and disadvantages have just been kind of in the, the salient, become more salient as a result of these things. And some of the advantages that I know researchers have uh, really welcomed is um, enhanced recruitment potential um, and 
broader reach and lower costs uh, and the ability to get larger samples than they would have been able to use in their um, planned offline face-to-face uh, -face methods. Um, possible disadvantages, particularly in a qualitative interview context um, that have been raised, reduced data quality, that, that's certainly the experience of some researchers. Certain types of samples cannot be accessed online still. Um, and then this lack of control and, and the ethics issues that this um, gives rise to. So I, I think I'd just conclude and um, wind up now by saying that um, despite all the difficulties enhanced um, with, with the lockdown restrictions and pandemic and the implications for researchers and, and our PhD students, um, there have been some positives to come out of, of this situation and certainly um, some very creative um, ways of developing research uh, projects, models, designs that take advantage of um, what can be done in internet mediated research methods that involve gathering data online. And I've seen some really successful applications of this approach by researchers who hadn't really dreamed that they, they'd want to do this or weren't really thinking of doing about this um, in the near future. Uh, in, the, in the immediate uh, context of their, their research projects. Okay, um, I think that's uh, hopefully left a, a little bit of time for some questions. That was fascinating, Claire. Thank you so much. We've had loads of questions, and what we have, just so everyone knows, the way we've tied out is we have question and discussion after each of the three speakers, three sets of speakers we have today. And then we'll have some, some more additional questions at the end. And we've already had a lot of people in the chat saying, can you please share the slides, which is always a good indication. People find it all fascinating, but thank you so much. Okay, looking at a few uh, questions. Okay, we had loads of questions here. Uh, <clears throat> the, what are your thoughts on research staff and students using personal social media accounts to recruit participants in social media sites? Uh, so with some researchers apparently raising issues with institutions that they feel it will hamper recruitment efforts if they can't use their personal social media accounts to recruit that way, possibly because they have they feel they've forged connections with a potential group of participants or they have a large social media presence and therefore feel that's an effective way to do recruitment. What are your thoughts on this? That, that's a really good question because it is something we I've had to think about personally and develop a perspective on that, to be honest. Um, the, uh, so yes, if you've got connections with um, uh, a certain, so like a Twitter group or a WhatsApp or whatever, I've certainly had researchers saying, you know, I want to do research on this community. I'm part of this community. I'm, I'm in this group. Um, is it okay to uh, recruit participants myself with my personal um, account? And I have to say my initial response was, one of concern about that and and that was shared by the the other members of the ethics committee um, but i i think with safeguards um about protecting the reputation of, of the in my case the open university um we we have actually allowed this this to go ahead in certain circumstances um where it's really been beneficial because this this connection i, I think this applies more to qualitative type research projects for example where uh, or ethnographic research, where researchers, um, their connection, their existing connection with the participants can be um, an important part of sort of almost engaging them as co-researchers or empowering participants, I think, is the arguments that I've heard um, of, of, of taking this approach. Um, so I think um, as long as, um, if this is about recruiting participants and then any kind of data collection activity is moved to a secure environment rather than using the WhatsApp or, or whatever kind of software might be less secure, um, then I don't have major reservations about this. I mean, there are caveats um, about having a professional um, contact, you know, a, a professional invitation or um, making that initial contact and then guiding people to proper informed consent forms. So all those ethics um, principles and requirements are covered, but it's certainly not something I now would uh, rule out. And I can see why there are certain advantages to doing that rather than coming in as a, you know, from a, a, a official university formal um, account and approach. So I, I think it, as always, um, it's very much context dependent. 
And this is the kind of thing that I would not expect an ethics committee to rule out of the question, given some certain um, context and circumstances. And we've certainly considered it to be um, yeah, acceptable um, for some research. Uh, James, I'm just read the news. Lauren asks, could you share how your ethics committee deals with issues around big data, such as data mining resulting in the inadvertent collection of identifying information like usernames, IP addresses, geolocation, and the like? Right. We don't have a lot of big data projects and applications coming to us as a human research um, ethics committee. So we haven't had to um, deal with it as much as we may have done um, if we were you know, had more, more people doing that kind of research. Um, so uh, what we do basically is um, we have data protection and information security um, units, obviously, at the university. So we work closely with them and we refer researchers to them. Uh, so, so consulting with these experts is, and, and data scientists is absolutely crucial. Um, we ask um, applicants to the ethics committee to uh, basically um, give us a statement that they've done that and outline the safeguards they're going to have to avoid any of these issue, issues of the types of things that, um, uh, that I outlined in, in my presentation. So um, big data, I'm, I presume that the, uh, the, the person asking the question might be, th would be thinking about big data without consent involved. Um, you can yeah, they, can't. Inadvertent data collection, you know, because yeah. you're not getting everything. The, the key things uh, for us is to, to, to strip out IP addresses, uh, to, to avoid collecting them in the first place, things like IP addresses or anything that could be used to identify um, individuals and certainly strip them out straight away um, and, and anonymize those data sets. Uh, there's no need to keep those in there really in those situations. And, and we would just be looking for um, rigorous procedures and safeguards to ensure that um, personal identification is not possible. In, with, in, in the way those big data sets are handled and used. So certainly it's what researchers are doing. Of course, also the other thing is dissemination. I mean, this is a really key thing and we find that a lot of researchers fail to um, really appreciate uh, to, the, to the extent they need to, how important dissemination plans are. And, and you know, some researchers seem to think, well, I've finished dealing with the participants or collecting their data, I've got it now, it's anonymized. Uh, that's fine, I can do whatever I want with this. But dissemination is crucial because I raised the issue of combining data sets to um, uh, de-anonymize data, re-identify data. So we'd want a clear um, plan for dissemination and how the safe safeguards are implemented in dissemination plans so as to completely minimize any risks, in fact, reduce them as far as possible of um, personally identifying anyone uh, linked to those big data sets. And it's often not um, a major concern really um you know often there's a kind of visual graphs and things like the nike plus and run keeper data where it's difficult to see how anyone could be personally identified from that um maybe maybe a, a thank you to the users who <laughs> if they came across it and thought is my data in there you know um could be helpful as well that that's you know thank you to the participants who use nike plus or whatever is often good practice in in those situations um so Thank you. Uh, Philip asks, could you share your procedure when things go wrong? So if it comes to light that data collected did not follow due process, but the researchers feel the data in itself is of value to the public society and so on. Ah, okay. Um, if I understood that correctly, um, there, there are always examples where due process has not been followed. Um, very few, unfortunately, but we have examples, it may just be um, a naivety on the researchers part that they didn't need ethics approval. Um, and so they've done something that wouldn't have been approved basically by the committee. In most cases where, where we have to do what we call retrospective approval, we find that um, we can ask for, uh, for example, consent to be gained where it wasn't. In relation to big data in particular, um, I think due process if it's not followed in the first instance, it needs to be that needs to be corrected. Um, so, so we would certainly say that that these data cannot be published until we've taken steps to strip out personal information, for example. Um, and then again, it's going through the same safeguards just to, just to check that that can be done um, after the event. And with big data approaches, it generally can. And unless something's been published already, in which case I haven't come across that issue, that that would be problematic. Um, 
but we've seen that happen with um, you know journal editors having to pu publish apologies for papers that have been published without proper ethics approvals in place. Um, but I think um, yeah, it would be a, a, a matter of um, trying to rectify that after the event um, for us. Um, the, the interesting question about where it's of value to society. I mean, this is one of the key um, things that informs ethics committees in their decisions, uh, weighing up you know the advantages and, and the benefits of a piece of research with the risks. Um, it, underlies every decision we make, basically. So that would be taken into account, of course. Uh, to, to what extent would this benefit society to share these data? And what are the risks involved in trying to balance those things out? Thank you. I can see it's fascinating because there's both a, a new and emerging field of research. So the problems that are being brought up can are quite singular, but also saying what you just said, I can see many commonalities with an ethics committee dealing with issues that would come up about a non-internet mediated research project where it came to light that permission should have been short but sought but wasn't or perhaps ethical approvals weren't followed through so there's you know there, i think there's, there's both new issues to be grappled with but also kind of existing ones manifesting themselves in new research environment thank you so much that was fascinating